Hello, this is John Wallace, Senior Editor at Laser Focus World, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Laser Focus World Online. Today's event, Infinite Possibilities, Easily Combining Scanner and Servo Motion, will be presented by Scott Schmidt, Group Manager of the Laser Processing and Micro Machine Group at Aerotech. Following the talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation via the web using your Ask a Question box by clicking in the open area and clicking the Ask Question button to submit. And please feel free to submit questions. Also, if you should need technical assistance, you may type your question in the same Ask a Question box. It's recommended that you close down all other applications for best performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from the home page at www.laserfocusworld.com. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Scott Schmidt. Thank you, John, and welcome to everybody for this webinar. Uh, I'm glad to have you here, and I hope that uh, it's a productive event for everybody involved. As John mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Schmidt, and I work in the laser processing and micromachining group at Aerotech, and actually have worked with Laser Focus World on some past events as well, and we'll touch on that in the upcoming slides. I uh, would also like to uh, talk about some of the features under discussion for this webinar, namely the ability to combine servo and scanner motion in one integrated environment in a way that's easy for the end user to program and to manage their applications. Along the way, we'll step into our laser marking lab, our laser process development lab, and see some video of actual marking examples of real patterns uh, that, that are done on the fly and dynamically just to try to show some of the versatility of the tools that we have, and then get into uh, a restatement of, of the value additions that, that these tools have to current and relevant market applications uh, and, and look at some future work that Aerotech is considering and that we believe the market at large should think about performing. So some of the past work that we have done alongside Laser Focus World and presented in webcasts such as this dealt with high-speed Galvo accuracy and performance. In other words, trying to characterize these very dynamic systems with respect to the marking accuracy that a user would see down at the focal plane on their workpiece. And we looked at different error contributions, uh, where they come from, how to deal with them, and how modern users ought to be aware of those as they look at their processes and try to judge what sort of accuracy is reasonable for devices that are made using these types of galvos. Well, for today's problem statement, we should recognize that high-precision motion control applications do seek to take advantage of these high dynamic devices. In other words, users want the best of both worlds. They would love to see the excellent error performance and precision capabilities of servo stages, but they also want to take advantage of the high dynamics of laser steering capabilities of modern scanners as well. So some application examples are noted here, uh, two photon polymerization, glass panel and film processing, additive manufacturing are just a few. Traditionally, the use of scanners would involve a step and scan technique, which is fundamentally limited by the Galvos field of view. In other words, you would expose some portion of the workpiece to the Galvos field of view, then use underlying servo stages to move the workpiece or the Galvo to expose a new portion of the workpiece to the Galvos field of view again. So there are some inherent problems with doing that, and we'll talk a little bit about those and see them. But some more modern tools recently developed allow post-processing of the, of the drawings that describe the work pieces and the parts to be manufactured that allow an easy programming steps, some easy programming steps to be used to turn those drawings into motion control code that even novice users can very quickly master uh, to produce working pro programs and therefore get into the application and do what they know best instead of being mired in motion control and trying to decide how to split motion between scanners and servos. I mentioned some of the applications in this space. Uh, here are some other ones, such as via hole drilling, fuel injector hole drilling uh, for both uh, gasoline and diesel 
uh, devices, medical device processing, let's say stent fabrication, um, replacing one or maybe even both of the traditional axes that are used in these applications with scanner, with scanner axes instead, or perhaps in combination with servos as well. Or printed circuit board uh, hole drilling or routing. Um, some of the images here are public domain, some are, some are uh, Aerotech, and the few that are in neither of those bins do belong to Oxford Lasers Group, um, as we credit here on this slide. So digging a little bit more into the step and scan technique, uh, we, we acknowledge that Galvos have a limited field of view. This is established by the optics that are resident inside the scanner. So those optics can be uh, the obvious things such as the turning mirrors and where they are located within the Galvo scanner housing, uh, but it also speaks to the F theta, the focusing lens, whether that's a telecentric, telecentric structure or not. Um, this also establishes the field of view uh, because of its optical characteristics and also its location relative to the two turning mirrors inside the scanner. So because we have a limited field of view, um, traditionally, as I mentioned, step and scan te techniques are used to expose the entire workpiece to this very limited or very small field of view. And when I say very limited or very small, uh, some typical values for very small spot sizes used in, in modern micro-machining applications today um, might be 20 millimeters by 20 or or 40 by 40, maybe upwards of 100 by 100, but still typically much smaller than that and routinely smaller than available servo travel for some of the high precision and high accuracy servo stages that are out there. But more on point, let's take a look at some of the step and scan issues. Fundamentally, a user now has to be a master in two programming environments, one for the scanner and one for the servo. So obviously this is a learning curve. It actually doubles the learning curve. And this is very off-putting for, for many users and many programmers because natively most controllers are not very similar to one another. The Galvo also has to dwell between the servo moves. So to expose the next available piece of, of the workpiece to the Galvo's field of view, there's a step and settle. So we have to wait until the, the servo rings into position, settles in, no dynamics present, and then we can start writing again with our servo. So this represents a loss in processing time and inefficiency. In the, in the overall process. And lastly, there are stitching errors. And this comes from the, from the fact that the fields of view, the field of view of the Galvo is never a perfect square. There's always going to be some nonlinearities where the edges are not going to match up perfectly. And I have some, uh, some microscope pictures of, of examples of this uh, coming up in a couple of slides. So a better way to think about this would be to envision a way of combining the servo and the scanner motion together. One option to do this is an Aerotech tool that we call Infinite Field of View. And this coordinates the motion of the Galvo and the scanner in a way that we'll see in one of the videos. Uh, we'll walk through some of those tools, the program statements. There's maybe a half a dozen that are truly and directly relevant to setting up this Infinite Field of View feature. But it does offer an integrated programming environment for both the Galvo and the servo axes. In fact, the programming experience for the user is in two axes. He programs in his XY coordinate frame using the, the Galvo axes, and the controller just figures out what goes to the servos. So we've reduced a four-axis programming complexity down to a simple experience of only two axes. Uh, and furthermore, it is programmed with standard G code, which is, which, uh, is a, a looser de facto standard, but still one recognized among many, many control systems. This is an example of what the motion partitioning between the servo and the scanner looks like. Uh, this is for a stencil pattern that, where the green long wave slow moving lines is the servo path and the red high directional change or high velocity, high dynamic content moves are undertaken by the scanner. So you can imagine uh, the, the, get, the Galvo being scanned slowly over top of the workpiece by the servo axes. In this case, it was a gantry arrangement, an overhead gantry and the Galvo axis just picking up the very, very high dynamics, high speed moves uh, to actually accomplish the very, very high throughput desired motion. If we dig in a bit more into the stitching errors, um, this is an example of a very long wavy pattern that was split up to accommodate a Galvo's limited field of view. And this is where these wavy lines that were actually for a photovoltaic application uh, were attempted to be stitched together. So as we look at the stitching errors, we can see that there's an offset of approximately 
a half a millimeter in this case. Now, admittedly, this was not a highly calibrated Galvo situation, but, but we'll see where maybe that is not such a big deal or such a great consideration uh, on the next slide. So even if we took great care and aligned up these two different fields of view, uh, maybe, maybe hand aligned them to eliminate this 500 micron offset between the, the uh, scorch marks of the end, the end points at the fields of view, if we look at the edges of the pattern, recalling that this is the middle, that offset is distorted even further up to a value of about 800 microns. So even if we painstakingly align these, these uh, features in the middle to overlap nicely and to join seamlessly, we would still be disjoint at the edges. And this, this owes to the nonlinearities that are inherent in scanners. We have a pincushion effect that distorts the, that pinches in the sides and the top and bottom of the field of view, or rather the sides, because the two turning mirrors are not located at exactly the same point in volumetric space. They obviously occupy uh, volume in space, so we have to separate them so that they don't collide with one another. So this, this represents a nonlinearity down at the scan field. Secondly, the F-data optics are very complex in nature, uh, manufactured from multiple pieces of glass in, in most cases to focus the light, telecentric lenses being even more complicated. And this also introduces a so-called barrel distortion, which bows out uh, the, the pattern at the top and bottom, or the field of view at the top and bottom and also at its sides. And it's this combination of a pincushion and a barrel distortion that overlay or multiply with one another and give you a net, and, and give the user a net field of view that's not truly a square. And because of these nonlinearities, the stitching errors are always going to be present in some form or another. Well, if we use infinite field of view, the obvious, the obvious outcome is that there's no stitching error. Uh, any errors that might be inherent in the Galvo uh, or might be present due to distortions at the edges of the field of view will be distributed over the pattern so that they don't become disjoint, um, don't, don't have disjoint features within the pattern or within, on the workpiece. Furthermore, one feature of infinite field of view that we will see during the videos is the fact that we can now artificially restrict the field of view of the Galvo to only use that sweet spot, the center cut in the middle of the field of view where most of the, where the behavior is most linear and the errors are most small. Uh, because, and we can do this very easily because we have the servos to rely on to give us an effective field of view that is equal to the servo travel. So this is a nice tool. That's a beautiful tool for combining servos and scanners, but it would still be nice to have some method or some means of interpreting uh, a customer workpiece drawing, a DXF file or a DWG, some vector-based drawing that, that uh, his CAD designer has made, and be able to parse that directly down into the motion control code that's going to run on our A3200 motion controller. Well, this tool is, is what we call it at, at Aerotech CAD Fusion. And this does produce code that integrates directly into the motion controller. Uh, in other words, there's no, there's no other post-processing post that is needed. We get a look here at some of the diagnostic or some of the input windows, I should say, for CAD Fusion, where we have the ability to make project settings that we'll see once again in the videos to allude to that, but also the ability to set up laser firing tools automatically using a series of easy-to-manipulate to drop-down lists uh, that identify the hardware you have and automatically script the code to fire the laser. So speaking of that laser firing, a further tool accessed by the motion controller and configured by CAD Fusion is what we call PSO. So this is uh, position synchronized output. And this triggers the laser or any end effector or tool that is being used in this process based directly on the encoder feedback. And an important thing to call out here is the encoder feedback that is referenced is not just that from the servo and it's not just that from the scanner, but rather it's the combined positional feedback information from the servo and the scanner. Thought of another way, this could be think, this could think of uh, as uh, four times positional feedback, uh, so four axis PSO. And as an example of where this might be useful, is where we have deliberate velocity changes around the part profile. For instance, as we go around the the, the radius, the sharp radius of the of the uh, cartoon picture on this slide. Traditionally the laser or the tool would be fired in some fixed fre frequency or time-based fashion, and there would be an assumption or a hope that the velocity regulation was constant enough and stable enough to not follow the writing campaign uh, doing it this way. But 
if we know precisely where the laser is, because we know where the galvos are and where the servos are, if we know precisely where that laser spot should land based on the, on the real-time encoder feedback, then we don't care about velocity regulation anymore. We don't care about trying to trigger the laser during accelerations because we know that we're going to fire based on position and not based on some hope of a constant velocity. So it's a far more deterministic writing tool. Okay, with this background information, uh, we, we can go on to the videos. Uh, we'll launch them one after the other. There are actually two, one, one which is a setup uh, of, of all the tools in CAD Fusion moving into our Motion Composer suite, and the second one is actually the writing campaigns. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, thank you for joining us in Aerotech's Laser Development Lab. Here we'll be demonstrating some of the features of CAD Fusion, specifically how it has the ability to post-process vector-based drawing files, DXF or DWG files, into motion control code that can then be run immediately by our A3200 controller. Along the way, we'll try to highlight some of the features that CAD Fusion offers, some of the optimization schedules and settings, and get a look at how this can play into better using scanner and servo motion combined. I've already prepared at least the skeleton of a CAD Fusion project that we see on the screen now. And really, there are some optimization settings that we'll walk through, but the, the thing that's probably most important to point out at this time is the bounding box that I've established that defines what is the servo travel range that we have available to us. This is about 200 by 300 millimeters um, in rough terms, and certainly is much larger than the field of view of the Galva that we're using, which is our AGV 14 HP that establishes a field of view of approximately 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters. So clearly this will allow us to see the advantages of infinite field of view and how the servo and scanner axes can combine together to get the best possible motion control profile. We'll begin by importing a shape. And the first import that we will perform is a stencil pattern. So you can see this has many fine features but features that are spread out about this entire 200 by 300 available field of travel such that not all of them can be traced by the Galvo in one field of view. I'll move these into inside my bounding box to make sure that my servo can reach all of these different positions. And we can get a look at all the shapes that have been traced. So you can see that there are many, many thousands of shapes that are included in this layer. I'll then perform an optimization that allows CAD Fusion to dictate in what order these shapes ought to be written onto the workpiece. So obviously we might consider tracing in a clockwise fashion or counterclockwise. Uh, we might give preference to vertical versus light left to right motion, uh, depending on what the feature density is. So here we see that we have a lot of, a lot of dense, dense features that are left to right, and so I'll assign a horizontal weight of something greater than one and a vertical weight of something less than one. Of course, this optimization can be performed on a global setting or on a project by project setting or drawing by drawing setting as well. We can also define if the shape should be traced clockwise or counterclockwise, or if duplicate entries, redundant entries, should be remo removed from the pattern automatically by CAD Fusion or not. But for the time being, we will, we will optimize in a fashion that will have CAD Fusion trace the pattern generally preferred left to right as opposed to north and south. We see that the panel is grayed out to the left as CAD Fusion performs this optimization. And you can see that on the very general sense, our shape settings started with uh, numbers in 3600 and now they're something greater than 6000. So clearly CAD Fusion has altered the order of execution of these shapes. While we're in the settings, we can look at some other optimization switches that are available to us. This allows us to declare what the axis names are, whether they are linear or rotary axes, and also declare what should be the processing feed rate, in this case 500 millimeters per second, and the jump speeds in between shapes, in this case two meters per second. There are some other features that we can optimize as well, but I think what's most important to spend time on at this point is looking at program initialization and termination. This allows users to automatically insert into every part profile 
some code or some program statements that will be executed with every program that this Cat Fusion project generates. For instance, if you have input and output code calls or, what, or desire to set up tools based on I.O. or some other third-party statements, this is where you could type them in. Including items as simple as just declaring home and enable statements can be typed in directly in this box and will automatically be inserted into the code that Cat Fusion generates. In our case, we've actually pre-written a file that has program statements that will automatically configure infinite field of view and insert them at the beginning of the program. This program that I've created is all we can take a look at in our motion controller soft motion composer controller software. And you can see that it's a relatively short program, less than 40 lines of code, including comments, but it declares all of the infinite field of view statements that will be necessary to combine the servo and the stage motion, the servo and the scanner motion. The key points of this are declaring axis pairs, saying that the small y scanner axis is in the same direction as the capital Y servo axis, and likewise little x with capital X. We have some amount of scaling to make sure that one unit in the scanner space is equal to the same unit in the servo space. We have the ability to, to perform synchronized motion in a, third, in a third direction, say the Z direction. Um, however, in this case, we don't have a fast Z axis configured with this test setup, and so we'll declare that to be none. The key settings that follow define the infinite field of view size, which is identically the Galvo field of view. In our case, the A3200 parameter file declares, using software limits, what the field of view should be. In our case, because we have a field of view of 40 by 40, these soft limits in the parameter file are plus 20 and minus 20. As you can see, I'm scaling this down to something less than the full value. So instead of using a, a factor of 2.0 because the limits are unidirectional, instead I will use 1.75, and this allows me to automatically discard the nonlinear portions of the field of view from my writing campaign and only use the central portion of the Galvos field of view where the behavior is most linear and most accurate. A, a user may imagine restricting this even further to get better accuracy with almost no loss of processing capability because infinite field of view will then be able to respond to a smaller field of view by using more of the servo's motion to compensate and still be able to achieve a workpiece size that's equal to the servo to travel in both directions. The remaining characteristics are an infinite field of view tracking speed and acceleration, which defines limits for how fast the, the servo axes will be able to travel and how hard they can accelerate, and also an infinite field of view time, which represents a buffer that the motion controller looks ahead in milliseconds to be able to capture the trajectory and use that information to issue commands to the servo. In other words, it will look ahead in our case 200 milliseconds and do its best to keep the entire drawing in the field of view of the Galvo by appropriately commanding the servos. If the servo speed and tracking acceleration commands would be violated by this, then the entire motion control campaign is slowed down such that the servos travel as fast as, as they are dictated by the tracking speed and tracking acceleration parameters and still allow the Galvo's field of view to be exposed to the entire workpiece. So the, the contents of this entire program will be pasted in by Cat Fusion into the, in, into the beginning of the file because we call this a program initialization. Similarly, Cat Fusion can insert code at the end of the file that we would call program termination code. For instance, if subroutines must be declared or if there is some machine housekeeping and shutdown that must take place after any given writing campaign. After we accept these settings, the last thing to do is to set up our tool. We spoke a little bit during the presentational materials about the PSO as a tool for controlling lasers using Automation 3200. We have the ability to have CAD Fusion automatically add this tool to our repertoire. We can apply this tool to everything in our shapes, everything on our canvas, and the resulting code will automatically be implemented. So we can get a look at that right now. As we export our code, we have the opportunity to preview it. 
Of course, we should recognize all of the infinite field of view statements that we reviewed before in Motion Composer are now present in the code. Additionally, the PSO configuration statements have automatically been, been inserted as well, and more importantly, most importantly, the firing statements to arm the PSO and turn it off during each marking move have been made. We can accept this code. We will call this example one of our writing campaign. And now we can jump over to, mo to A3200 Motion Controller once again and open the file that we've just generated. So, now that we're ready to fire, we can click Run and witness the, the writing campaign. So we can witness the system beginning here. And the first moves you'll see are very long vector moves. And this proves that we can, we can achieve lines that are continuous and still not exceed, and that yet exceed the field of view of the Galvo without having to stitch and team frames together. As we've called out before, the motion is generally left to right, and so the feature density in that direction is judged to be more dense, and so that should be the preferred way of, uh, of processing the pattern. Of course, if we had, if we decided that our feature density was, was more rich or more dense, orthogonal to this direction, then we can change the weighting and put the impact regions optimization to compensate. Again, the servo is, is accomplishing just longer, slower moves, and of course, the Galvo is picking up all of the very, very fine features as various parts of the work piece are exposed to the field of view. If this level of optimization is not ideal, or it's not what is most desired either by the process or by the programmer, then CAD Fusion allows us the opportunity to manually change all of the optimization settings as well. So for instance, if we have patterns that are very close to one another, it might be subject to greater heat affected zones, we might want to deliberately move away and have a less optimal path to avoid injecting too much heat into the, into the work substrate by writing features that are very close to each other and very dense as well. So even though CAD Fusion might think that a given optimization strategy is the best one, the user always has the last say, and we can manually optimize any pattern simply by clicking and dragging elements in the CAD Fusion element tree and reposting the program. As our writing campaign is almost done here, we'll have the opportunity to take a look at some other examples as well. Okay, so now our pattern is complete. Of course, if we were unhappy with the cycle times, we can change some of the infinite field of view parameters to, to uh, try to better optimize that. Or, if we were unhappy with the execution order, CAT Fusion affords us several different strategies of performing that optimization, either manually or in an automated fashion as well. So, we can change over our workpiece to prepare for the next pattern. In this case, we'll have a pattern that has more long vector lines and fewer of the very small short feature lines. So in preparation, we will go ahead and clear the canvas. And we can also clear all of our canvas layers as well. As you can see, I accidentally deleted my bounding box, so we'll leave that in there. and clear the rest. For the next pattern, we'll use one of the examples that, are, that come as, as installed with Cat Fusion, which is our eagle pattern. And of course, it shows up very, very small on the canvas, but that's no problem because one of the features of Cat Fusion is easy scaling, just as within any CAD CAM package. So we can scale this. As you can see, we exceed the, the, the servo travels by some very small amount. 
but that's okay. We can also reorder and, re and move and pan drawing elements very easily in CAD Fusion as well. So now that all of our elements are contained within the allowable range base of the servo stages, we can perform the same optimization that we did before. And for the sake of uh, consistency, I'll leave the same weighting on between horizontal and vertical. CAD Fusion's performed the reordering of the parts of, of, the, of the features. We can see that our PSO's tool is still applied from before. And all of our optimization settings should also be applied as well. So we will export this code. Using this, calling this as example two. And we're ready to visit Motion Composer and open that new program. So, once again, we can see that our code has been inserted into the program for initialization, and the PSO structure is correct as well. So, we can click run on this and witness the writing campaign be equal as well. The bounding box is established just as before. And now we can see a greater richness in longer vector moves that take advantage of not only the servo travel, but still are able to highlight the nimbleness of the galvo as well. So, we have one more example to show. As we clean the slate one more time from Pad Fusion, we can import one last time a set of house numbers. So obviously these are too big, opposite from the eagle pattern. So we can rescale them and begin to cut and paste them over top of our canvas. So perhaps now we'd like to rescale them maybe even a little bit more. So now they all fit within the canvas, and we can get a look to see which ones are executed in which order. But again, we'd like to give Cat Fusion a, a, a chance to optimize this. So we'll allow it to perform the same weighting left to right as done in some of the other examples. And we can see that the shapes were shuffled in their order. We can repost the program as what we will call example three. Jump over to Motion Composer once again, load the program and execute it. Once again, we can observe the bounding box being tried first. And then portions of the different letters, but always in continuous segments. So in other words, the middle of the nine would be described as one continuous line, so there's still no stitching errors. Continuous lines and, and uh, short segments are preserved and are never violated by the Galvez field of view, even if we have a weighting that's heavily in the horizontal or heavily in the vertical direction. So hopefully this is giving you a good feeling for the types of patterns and the types of functionality that CAD Fusion and Infinite Field of View can offer together. And uh, if you have any questions, please post them to the webinar. I'll be, I'll be sure to do my best to answer them. Thanks. Okay, so we're back from the lab. Hopefully that was uh, interesting to see, and I apologize for the screeching noises on the laser. We actually wanted to make sure that the laser power was tuned up high enough that we made as visible a marks as possible on those painted aluminum plates, so hopefully that wasn't too, too much of an annoyance for, uh, for the attendees here. So to recap some of the value statements that we have uh, for, for these tools, Infinite Field of View as a feature and CAD Fusion as an application, uh, we do have an integrated tool for drawing conversion and tool setup. So everything resides within one software package. Uh, it generates code that is directly um, consumable by Motion Composer in A3200. But most importantly, most importantly, uh, this allows 
expert level use of tools by novice by, people, by uh, users with novice level training. Uh, we have no stitching errors, so the process improvements hopefully are, are, uh, are clear. Sometimes, many times, most times, this is a process time improvement over a step and scan solution. And hopefully we've been able to demonstrate that the programming environment and the, pro the software development experience is very straightforward and not a very arcane exercise that's difficult, frustrating, and challenging. So use cases to revisit these. Uh, one perhaps obvious case would be in processing very large glass panels, uh, so-called ITO or silver nanowire processing, where we have patterns that many, many times typically are larger than the field of view for the optical setup Galvo that would need to have a spot size to trace these features. So maybe we need a spot size of 25 or 30 microns, and this would involve using a telecentric lens that maybe has a field of view of only 25 or 30 millimeters square. So if we desire to, uh, to trace a glass pattern, a glass panel, sorry, that is hundreds of millimeters in either direction, then obviously we need a tool to compensate for this. Secondly, any sort of micro-machining application, perhaps one that has a truly tiny field of view, uh, 200 microns by 200 microns, so that we can have perhaps uh, integrated gas delivery through the same optical train or, or along on axis of the optics, uh, the field of view is going to be truly minuscule, but that's okay because in can, infinite field of view can accommodate this. So even in so-called micro-machining applications, the notion of infinite field of view can still be very, very beneficial. Well, as we digest these kinds of developments, uh, we of course should always be thinking about what the next steps ought to be. Perhaps the most uh, immediate concern would be to start adding axes to this mask or to this application set, this toolbox. Um, for instance, a third axis of programming capability in CAD Fusion to be able to do three-dimensional shapes. So this is coming very, very soon. Um, similarly, with infinite field of view, it would be nice to have a dynamic fast axis that, that, is, uh, that is integrated into this mask and can combine its motion with that of the X and Y dimension. So, of course, this is, this is also work that's ongoing. Um, we should consider different pattern types. We demonstrated a set of vector-based drawings, but bitmaps would also be interesting to trace and to have automatically set up with respect to the laser firing tools. This is a feature, actually, that as of about two weeks ago is now native to CAD Fusion. So now bitmaps are possible as well. But we should continue, continue to stretch the boundaries and look at solid models and layered, layered files and things like this as well, in addition to the, to the very basic um, file set that we have ownership of right now. And lastly, it would be very interesting to be able to ascertain what are the overall errors that a user experiences. So we can probably measure the, the Galvo static errors, the point-to-point -point errors. We know we can measure those in the servos as well. Um, but the dynamics uh, would be very, very interesting as well to try to characterize in both of those um, systems or both of those subsystems. But most interestingly, and probably most difficult, would be to determine what unknown errors, errors that aren't obvious to us right now, are introduced by, by combining infinite field of view. And probably we can take some, some pretty good guesses at that, and, and uh, we've done some work and presented some, some, um, some papers, actually, on this. Uh, at various technical conferences uh, in the country and around the world, but it would be nice to have a stronger characterization of that that, that is able to, able to segregate and characterize all of these errors, ones that are static versus dynamic, servo versus, versus scanner, or systemic combined errors as well. So this is all on our plate for future work that we hope to be able to present um, in the very, very near future. Uh, with that, my material to, to present is done. Um, I hope that you'll have some questions for me, and I look forward to them. So we do have one question uh, that that talks about the update, uh, asks about the update time between the encoder feedback and the Galvo movement. So the encoder feedback is actually felt, fed directly into the controller, the NMARC controller that governs the, the Galvo motion and indeed partitions the motion uh, be, between the Galvo and the servo. Because this is hardwired information, it is fed directly on a board level to the Galvo drive. This happens in real time, um, so with, with, with non-existent latency. So this is a hardwired signal, so the Galvo knows immediately the servo position. Uh, this 
is in contrast to perhaps trying to accommodate this information at the servo update rate or even worse still at the communication rate between the motion control drives and the PC running the programs. So we avoid those millisecond delays that might be native to, to switching packets between the PC and the controller. And furthermore, we even avoid the microsecond or, or tens or hundreds of microsecond delay that might be native to trying to do this at the server update rate and only pulling that position then. So uh, truly, this happens down at the hardware level, and uh, we are able to do this in real time with, with virtually no latency. OK. All right. Well, um, one question is, um, let's see if I can. I did not notice any details behind configuring the uh, PSO tool in CAD Fusion. Can you explain that a bit more? So uh, I the, PSO over. Is, the PSO is a position synchronized output. Yes, so the, the, this PSO tool um, is what we used in the videos to, uh, to, to trigger the laser, actually. And um, I, I probably too briefly covered that uh, during, during the presentation itself. Um, but this, this is where we pull the positional information from the servos and the scanners in a combined fashion, actually, and use that as a basis to fire the laser. Um, I'll revisit one of the older slides or one of the earlier slides from the presentation. And uh, hopefully the window uh, off to the right where the PSO tool is called out is, is reasonably visible to everybody. I know that uh, perhaps it's not, not blown up enough to see, see in a detailed fashion. But really what I wanted to carry away from this statement or this answer is that uh, the drive types are selectable. So you can pick what kind of amplifiers or what kind of hardware you have in the system. Uh, then CAD Fusion automatically knows what that device's configuration is. And it gives you only the allowable choices for setting up whether I want to fire a pulse every 100 microns or one millimeter. Or maybe I want to fire continuous pulses. So all of these different firing campaigns, all of these options are available in, as drop-down lists and that drop-down list is dynamically configured as you tell it what hardware you have. From that, from that point, it's as simple as just saying uh, what, what is the fixed distance, for instance, uh, that you would like to fire the laser pulse, and how long in microseconds would you like that pulse to be. Cat Fusion takes it from there and configures all the rest of the PSO code. Um, I suspect that that was probably too quick of an answer for that uh, based on the, the presentational material I have with that, but, but certainly um, I, I do in, Encourage, encourage you to visit the website or to send me an email directly if I can if I can offer any more information. Okay, next question. We have a system running, and I assume this is Aerotech um, numbers A thirty two hundred version four hundred nine with X Y tables and A B galbos. The galbos are not from Aerotech, and they do not have any feedback. Will they work? Um, so that, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, typically, for the PSO functionality that we want, um, we, we, we rely on that feedback from the Galvos. So from a PSO standpoint, uh, that feature is going to be lost with these third-party Galvos um, for, uh, for which the Aerotech controller doesn't have any direct encoder or positional feedback or information. However, infinite field of view is still in play. Um, we have the ability, so long as, so long as you can grab the servo feedback, um, then infinite field of view is still in play. Uh, we, we have the ability to speak to and to control third-party Galvos uh, using one of, one of the products in our NMARC line. Um, so long as that Galvo complies to the serial communication protocol that is called XY2100. So this is another industry standard for, for sending serial commands to Galvos. Um, so as long as that third-party Galvo is XY2100 compliant, then infinite field of view is absolutely still in play. CAD Fusion can still parse out the code and Motion Composer can still, can still process it. So every, every feature that we demonstrated and that we saw in the video, with the notable exception of PSO, is still available to that configuration. OK, uh, one viewer just wants to know, in the first video, what is the oversize, overall size of the workpiece? And actually, if you can add any other specifications uh, of this scanning, that would be good, too. Okay. So the, in the examples, Specifically, the workpiece, uh, the, the travel of the stages that we had, the underlying servo stages, were 200 millimeters by 300 millimeters. As you might imagine, that's an arbitrary choice. If we had, and therefore our workpiece was constrained by approximately those dimensions, 200 by 300. 
Um, however, that, that, is, that is truly arbitrary. Um, with the infinite field of view feature, the servo travels can be anything. They can be meters, uh, one meter by one meter. Um, so long as, that, as the encoder feedback from those servo axes is fed into the NMARC controller, the Galvo can, can truly have an infinite field of view. That's the name. It, the, the field of view, the effective field of view on the marking plane would therefore only be limited by the servo travel, which, as I've already mentioned, can, uh, can, can be arbitrary. Okay. Um, I noticed some other tools in the menu groups of CAD Fusion during the videos. What are those for? Um, so that, that was probably the, uh, the, the menu groups that are up toward the top of the CAD Fusion window. Uh, I used a couple of them during the video, things such as, uh, as scaling and some of the view windows. Um, however, the, the canvas that CAD Fusion uses uh, is built around and incorporates all the standard AutoCAD features. So we can drop in new original elements into the drawing. You can, we can make our own CAD Fusion drawings from a clean canvas, from a blank slate. Um, so there are features such as dropping in polylines, uh, circles and ellipses, um, straight lines, uh, bezier splines, bitmaps, as I mentioned before, of course, squares, rectangles. So any of the available palette uh, of, of shapes that is typically available to AutoCAD users or, or uh, even some of the SOLIDWORKS stuff is, is immediately available in CAD Fusion. Now, it's not envisioned to be truly a CAD design tool, although it has many of those capabilities. But uh, as you might imagine, this might be useful for cleaning up drawings or making minor edits instead of having to revert all the way back to the CAD, the CAD CAM software program to make any very, very minor or small or trivial changes. Um, it's nice to have the ability to do these sorts of new drawing elements, scaling, rotating, shifting, copy paste, all of those sort of basic level um, canvas utilities are available within CAD Fusion. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Next question, can the infinite field of view be used for continuous moving programs like feed rolls and web processes? Um, I, I thought probably could be used for something like that, but we actually have uh, a more refined feature within A3200 and for the NMARC product suite that's a more finely focused or finely tailored um, application tool for that kind of web processing or roll-to-roll -roll processing, and, and it's, it's what we call mark on the fly. Um, it is a subset of infinite field of view in that, uh, just like with IFOV, one servo axis is bound to one scanner axis, and then we issue, uh, for lack of a better term, a free run or, or some sort of a motion command to the servo axis. Uh, let's say a constant motion. It doesn't need to be constant, but that's the easiest way to imagine it for the sake of this, of this discussion. Um, the, serv or the scanner automatically knows that the servo is moving underneath, and it subtracts the servo position from the trajectory that is commanded. So you can imagine a web of material moving underneath the scanner, and uh, one of the scanner axes might be moving side to side across the web, and the other one is keeping the spot along the workpiece at the right spot, even though the web is moving underneath. So this mark on the fly feature is ideal for web processing, um, but, but it's, it's uh, technically, or, or, or to, be a, to put a very fine point on it, is not infinite field of view. Uh -huh. Okay. And the last question is one of my own, and pardon me if it may sound uninformed, but the stage motion in the videos looks much more continuous than when I've seen step and scan being done. Does this somehow translate into a higher throughput? Um, it does have a higher throughput advantage. That, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a good takeaway to draw from those videos in that we don't have to wait to settle into position. Uh, and another, another takeaway that uh, maybe it's straightforward and maybe not, not as much, uh, not so much, is that the dynamic errors or the errors introduced through the servo dynamics ought to be lower uh, because we don't have this, this step and settle. So you, you might imagine step and settle has zero dynamic errors, but there's a, there's a price to be paid for that um, in the time that it takes to ring into position. So that absolutely is a, is a, a, a throughput price to be paid, um, a, as you mentioned, John. Um, yep. But, the, uh, the, but the, the fact that we can continuously move instead of having the accelerate to zero ring into position kinds of moves with infinite field of view allows us to mitigate even the dynamic errors that we experience. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. Uh, would you like to make any closing remarks? 
Um, I do appreciate the kind attention of all the attendees. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy days to, uh, to listen to me ramble on about some things. Um, I look forward to answering any other questions that may occur to the audience at, at a future time. Please feel free to contact me directly um, or, or via uh, Laser Focus World and, and this webcast. Um, there is more information about these features and about these types of applications at our website. So I hope that you all have time to uh, take a look at that and to digest that information as well. So thank you very much. Okay, well on behalf of Laser Focus World and Penwell Corporation, I would like to thank Scott Schmidt, Group Manager of the Laser Processing and Micro Machining Group at Aerotech, for today's presentation, Infinite Possibilities, Easily Combining Scanner and Servo Motion. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from the home page at www.laserfocusworld.com. A reminder, email message for the archive will be sent to registrants complete with a link to the archive. We thank you for joining us today and look forward to future webcasts.